Bibles and turn please to Matthew chapter number 20. I will be there in just a moment, the Lord willing. Dr. Sexton asked me to say something about our printing ministry. We've been printing Bibles for 44 years. In our church, we've printed right at 16, 17 million. Last year was one of the best years we ever had. We printed one million scriptures and mailed out one million scriptures. And uh, we just sent 329,000 to, uh, to North Korea in the Korean language. They're going to be smuggled in over the next five years from China in, in there. And uh, I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I, I try. It's too late now. It's out. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Brother Sexton's idea. Come and arrest him if you want to. <laughs> My wife, I want my wife to stand again. 51 years of marriage. 51 years. Thank you, honey. Thank you. <laughs> she has stayed with me all these years. Her dream boat has sunk twice. <laughs> you know what I mean? You saw some pictures of me when I was young. You know what I mean? It sunk at least twice. And then I am so blessed tonight. I have a gentleman here that I was called to preach under 54 years ago with us tonight. Brother Jack Parrott, you and Betty, stand up. Where are you, Jack? Stand up. You and your wife, stand up. Stand up, please, Brother Jack. God bless you. Thank you for coming tonight, my guest. Right back here to the right, Brother Jack Parrott. Hey, God bless you. God bless you. Yes, goodness. let's give him a good hand. Well, I've got some good news for you. My bedtime is 745, and I'm an hour from home, so we got five minutes. We better hurry, hadn't we? <laughs> I like preach. I like people. I love the Lord. Man, he saved me. Saved me, changed me drastically by his power and might. And I've just been trying these many years to tell folks uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful savior. A little young brave one day, I used to tell three or four humorous stories so I can get myself relaxed. I don't have enough stories tonight to tell you to get relaxed, so I'll tell you one and go on, all right? Is this young brave one day, young Indian brave, was trying to learn how to send uh, smoke signals. And so he gets up on this mountain, he takes this blanket and throws it over that fire and that smoke goes up and he looks. And he doesn't get any response whatsoever. So he goes over again, takes that blanket and spreads it over that fire. He looks and unbeknownst to him, about 500 miles away, they were checking an, an, an A-bomb. And when he did that, the earth shook because that bomb went off and that big old mushroom of smoke went up and that little brave said, I wish I'd have said that. <laughs> Amen. There's <laughs> some things I wish, I hope when I leave here tonight, I don't go home and say, boy, I wish I'd have said that. <laughs> hope I'd done that. Well, this last week was a very unusual week for me. I had uh, Dr. Sexton call me and get, ask me to, if I'd come and preach. What an honor. Such a place, such a man of God. What a privilege, one of the highlights of my life. I'm not just saying that because I'm here, I'm saying because it it's true. And then I had Senator Ken Yeager to call me. And he asked me to come down and be a minister of the day down in Nashville. But I got a greater invitation than that earlier this morning when the blessed Lord told me that I could come into his presence and just meet with him and talk with him. He's a wonderful Savior. Matthew 20, are you there? <clears throat> Will you stand with me? We're going to read seven verses, the Lord willing. <clears throat> Excuse me. For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that's a householder when he went out early in the morning, in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. When he agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and he said to them, go you also in the vineyard and whatsoever is right, I'll give you. And they went their way. And again, he went out the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, why stand you here all the day idle? That's as far as we'll read tonight. If you know the rest of the story, he, at the end of the day, he settles up with those that have worked the one hour or the many hours with a penny a day. That's what he settled with them. 
Father, make me a blessing. Thank you for this church, this pastor, these people. Speak to every heart, I pray in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Be seated, please. In our text tonight, we have a story of a man who's a householder. He has a vineyard. <clears throat> He's watched the process of it go. He's done the planting and the weeding and the sowing and getting it ready and harvest day comes and he gets up one morning and when he gets there, he uh, notices that the harvest is coming on and he doesn't have enough laborers to help him get the harvest in. So he goes down to the mall and the men are all sitting on the benches talking, the women are all shopping, <laughs> spending the men's money. Come on, men, hit me up. You want to get with us? All right, let's get with it. Come on. And uh, he sees them and he says, uh, would you go work for me? It's early in the morning now. It's before, it's before nine o'clock in the morning because we'll see he goes at the third hour, which is nine o'clock later. And evidently they must have go to the vineyard. And he goes back to his house. He looks and the harvest is still gonna perish. He doesn't have enough laborers. He goes back at nine o'clock in the morning the third hour of the day said, how about you? I need some more help. The, so the, the harvest is plenteous. The laborers are few. How about you? Then he comes back and he goes at noon. And again, the same question. He goes at three o'clock in the evening. Then five o'clock, the 11th hour, he goes out one final time. And he says, I need you. I want to preach tonight to you, if I could, for a few minutes on why labor the 11th hour? Why work this last hour? Why labor the 11th hour? Can I tell you, I believe we're living in the 11th hour. I believe Jesus Christ is coming soon. He's been coming soon ever since he left. <laughs> but I believe we're living close to the time of his coming we've ever lived before. And we're living in the 11th hour in our country. We certainly are. We're living in the 11th hour morally in our country. So much wickedness and violence and ungodliness. And I don't want to dwell on that tonight. It's just the reality of it. From leadership on down to anywhere else you want to look, it's there. And morally, we're living in the 11th hour. I believe that politically we're living in the 11th hour. Economically, I believe we're living in, in the 11th hour. I believe it's the hour. Jesus said, are not our 12 hours in the day? And here we have this one hour left. Religiously, we're living in that hour. So what do we do in this 11th hour? What do we do with our last hour that we have? Let me give you some suggestions I've got from some time back when the Lord gave this to me. First of all, you'll say this is very obvious, that one hour is better than no hour at all. If this is the only hour you're here and you're here tonight and you're, you're not, you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I recommend you get on, in on it. <laughs> I recommend you get saved tonight. Amen. I recommend tonight that you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And though you cannot give him the, probably the best of your life, you can give him the rest of your life. Amen. And maybe you're here tonight and you've backslid against God and you've gone away from God and you've drifted away from God. You say, oh, what can I do? i tell you what you can do. You can take what you have left and give it to Christ even tonight. Even this one hour is better than no hour whatsoever. You can give this one hour to the Lord Jesus Christ. You can give that to him. Some Sunday nights ago, I got through preaching and oftentimes I get a conviction in my own preaching. And I came forward to kneel at the altar to pray. I, my wife came in and put her arm around me. She said to me, she said, honey, let's finish up well. Amen. I want to finish up well. Amen. This 11th this hour, I want to go out with my guns shooting. I want to go off with everything I got, just going, everything I can. I don't want to rust out. I want to, if I can, I don't want to even burn out. just want to finish up, amen? amen? That's what I want to do. If it's this at one hour. When I first started preaching years ago, I preached on the street corners and in jails. I got a lot of folks think that's where I ought to be tonight. <laughs> we still go to jails. We had 12 people saved this week in jail services. Amen. We baptized, I think, 20-some here a few months ago in jail services. And uh, we're, we're just so blessed to do that. And I had a man that would go with me named Brother Carl Kidd. Brother K Carl Kidd was an older man. And I had so many stories I could tell you. It's, it's unbelievable. And I, and I, I don't want to get on these stories. If I do, we never will get through. But <clears throat> I'm going to tell you this, but it takes, I don't care how long it takes to I like this one, so I'm going to tell this one. I won't tell the other one. I'm going to tell both of them, all right? As a young preacher, Brother, brother, brother Sexton, is uh, I went there one night to go out to the men to preach. Well, I hadn't been saved very long. I think I hadn't preached. I don't think I'd even preached a sermon yet. I just made my announcement call to preach. And they said, now, Preacher Wall said, you got to go to Watburg Jail tonight by yourself. We don't have nobody to go with you. Well, I've never had a jail service all my life. I've just been at church, you know, and I'd watch them how they give invitation and all that stuff. So I said, they said, can you handle it? I said, I can handle it. So I got to Watburg Jail and they locked me in the cell with one man and walked away. 
I mean, they locked me in the cell. I'm serious. I'm nervous as I could be. Could be. The guy sitting on the side of the bed, and I said to him, I said, you got a song you want to sing. <laughs> That's what you do at church, isn't it? He said, let's sing Amazing Grace. We sang Amazing Grace. I said, anybody here got a prayer request? <laughs> Is that what you do at church? He raised his hand. He said, pray for my mother. I prayed for his mother. I said, well, I'm going to preach. I said, he, he sat down on the bed. I preached to him. I said, head bowed and eyes closed. I said, anybody here, if you're not sure you die, you go to heaven, raise your hand. He raised his hand. I didn't know you just tersely talked to somebody. I hadn't been saved long. He raised his hand. You need to get saved. I said, I'm going to sing one verse of just as I am. Anybody here want to get saved? Come forward. <laughs> I started singing just as I am. He got up and started coming forward. <laughs> and then I did what every preacher does. I said, what'd you come forward for? <laughs> Is that what you do? That's what you do. He said, I, he said, I want to get saved. And he man got saved that night. Amen. I went back to the church. I said, you won't believe this. And everybody in Wattenberg Jail got saved tonight. Amen. <laughs> Brother Kidd, the guy I was talking about, got put in a nursing home. He wanted to be a witness in the nursing home, and he started giving out tracts to everybody at the, at the door. He had a man in his room named Hurst Jeffers. Mr. Jeffers was a World War II veteran. He was, and I'm not being disrespectful, now, I'm just telling you the story. He was raised Presbyterian. He had no assurance of salvation. Brother Kidd would witness to him, and then he would say, Preacher, you witnessed to him, and I witnessed to him. And at about the fourth visit I was there, Mr. Jeffers said, I need to get saved, Preacher. I had a privilege to lead him to Christ. He said, now, preacher, said, I understand too. said, a man ought to get baptized. And I said, that's right. He said, you ought to get baptized. And uh, so I talked to him about baptism. And he couldn't leave the nursing home. His, and he didn't, we couldn't get permission to take him out of the nursing home. So we were going to baptize him at the nursing home. What we did, we took a lift chair, like a whirlpool. Lift chair, put you over in that whirlpool. And what he could do, he could, I could only get him over this far. I couldn't get him all the way under. And I think when you get baptized, you ought to get wet all over. What do you think? I said to that nurse, I said, nurse, you fill that five-gallon water bucket up right there. And when I get him as far as I can, you throw that water all over him. <laughs> and that's why we baptized him, amen. <laughs> it was the 11th hour, but we got the job done. Amen. And I want to recommend to you, if you just got one hour, get it done. Amen. Second thing, I want to tell you. You never know who you'll reach in the 11th hour. Stephen's 11th hour Never knew the effect he would have upon the life of one Saul of Tarsus as he's dying. And Saul of Tarsus sees the way he dies. And the conviction of God gets in his heart later on. He comes to know Christ. It was the 11th hour. 11th hour when Jesus was going from Jerusalem and passed through a place called Jer Jericho. And there was a tax collector that climbed up a tree because he wanted to see Jesus. Last time he had passed that way, Zacchaeus got saved that day at the 11th hour. It was the 11th hour when the thief on the cross thought all hope was gone. But thank God Jesus saved him during that hour. It was the 11th hour. I have so many stories I can tell you. I've got too many of them going through my mind. I have to preference this story with an with a illustration. And <laughs> you may remember some of these stories I told at chapel not too long ago. And I flatter myself by thinking you may have. <laughs> but... Uh, my daddy, my father, Garvin Walls, led the singing for Brother Parrott back here when he went at the church we went to there when I was a child growing up. And my dad was, he's well known. His name and my name's the same. He ran for congressman and uh, almost won. He was 25 years the mayor of our little town, Oliver Springs. He was the, he was the uh, president of the labor union here in Knoxville for years. So he's, his name was well known. I tell you that to tell you this story. One evening at the close of the day, the 11th hour of the day, I was visiting Oak Ridge Hospital <clears throat> and got in my car by the section I was going home and I saw a man named J.R. Woods running across the parking lot. And I said, J.R., where, where are you going? He said, I'm going home. He said, I've just been up and said, I've, I've visited my father. He's up in a certain room. I said, I'll go see him. He said, please don't go see him. He said, he don't like preachers. And I said, man, I like a challenge. I said, I'll go see him. And he said, well, I'm telling you, he won't welcome you. I said, that's okay. I went up to the room, knocked on the door, and Mr. Woods' daughter came to the door, and uh, J.R.'s dad's his sister came to the door. And, and I told her who I was and said, he won't speak to you. He said, he doesn't like preachers. And I said, well, I'll come all the way to the parking lot. Can I just step inside there to say hi to him? I stepped inside, and he had his head lean over on one of those uh, little tables, you know, where you surf food on I said, Mr. Woods, he said, I said, I'm Garvin Walls. He looked up and he said, you're not the Garvin Walls I know. 
He said, the garbage walls I know when I was hungry brought food to my house. He fed my family. He said, give me a job when I didn't have a job. And I said, well, I pastor Mount Pisgah Baptist Church. He said, I don't like preachers. And I said, I've got some I don't like. Not me and him, but other preachers. <laughs> and, he, and then he laughed just like you laughed. I've never done this before, never done it after. I said, if you won't let Garvin Walls, the preacher at Mount Pisgah, tell you about Jesus Christ, will you let, will you let Garvin Walls, his son? He said, yes. In 20 minutes, he trusted Christ. Amen. And I baptized him on a Sunday morning, about 6 o'clock one Sunday morning, three days before he died. Amen. The 11th hour. I think I'll just stay with it. Amen. I think I'll just finish up. They'll go on. It's the 11th hour. Next thing I want to tell you, I can't count, so whatever that is. You never know when you're working the 11th hour. Is this the last, I'm not being morbid about it. Is this the last Sunday night service we'll get to come to? I'm not being a bit morbid about that. The reality of life is this. Men are born to one a few days are full of trouble. They come forth with the flower and he's cut down. We have no assurance of the next breath we have. God's good to us, isn't he? Amen. Would you agree with me tonight? He's a wonderful savior. Amen. Has God been good to you? If you have, just wave at me a little bit. Say amen. amen. Yes, he has. Amen. And the blessings and mercy of God to us. Could this be the last night? I'll get to preach. If it does, man, I better get my best, hadn't I? Did you text that Sunday school class tonight for the last time? Was you on that bus route today? Did you sing in a choir last time? Did you sing that special tonight? Did you play on the instruments tonight? That's why you need to shake yourself and say, I need to give my best every time I get a chance to give my best. I need to give my best. Amen? Amen? It's important. 11th hour. Back in 1975, it won't take me that long to tell you the story, but... My dad was celebrating his 59th birthday with his twin brother. I've never done this to my family in all these years. I've been preaching for about 10 years. We were at a home, our home down in Sugar Grove Valley area in Tennessee. And I said, Daddy, I said, I'm driving back to West Virginia tonight to preach. I pastored a church up there. And I said, if you don't care, I said, if it's all right with you. We had about 50 some people there. I said, could I just say a word or two for, to our family before I leave? He said, sure, son. He got everybody in the big old living room and I did more crying than I did preaching. I got through. I gave him an invitation. A lady came forward and dealt at the television and got right with God. Her husband got right with God and they, became, they served in our church at Mount Pisgah when I was there. He was a deacon for years. He's still living. She's in heaven. Went home, went to West Virginia, had a service, 4.30. Monday morning, the phone rang and my sister said, daddy's gone. Of a thou. He was 59 years of age. Gone. Never been sick a day in his life. Was working on two houses, milling them. He's gone. I was so glad the last time I was there. I listened to the Spirit of God and shared my heart with him. Of a thou. One hour is better than no hour. Never know who you'll reach. This could be your 11th hour. I won't tell you why you are to labor the 11th hour. Because of the rewards in heaven. Amen. You can say what you want to, and you may not think that's a, a, a pure selfish motive, but I want to tell you, God is not unjust. Forget your work of love, your labor of love. And God's going to reward his servants one of these days. Far better than anything you'll ever get here. Most people will die of a, of a broken heart than they will a big head. There's going to be a time when we're going to be rewarded. Boy, Brother Sexton, I know there's five crowns and I can't talk about them tonight. But the soul winner's crown. Just to have Christ put a crown upon our head and us be able to go over to him and cast it at his feet and say, you're worthy. You're worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Years ago when my father couldn't get a job, I think I told this story at the 
college. My father couldn't get a job and we, we were living in Florida. I, was, I think I was 19 years of age then. I found a job and I was working as a laborer. I think I was making $2.09 an hour, I think. Big bucks. <laughs> then it was. <laughs> and uh, every Friday evening when I'd come home because my dad couldn't work, he didn't get a job, I'd give him my paycheck. One of the happiest members of my life. Even though I didn't like it then, to be honest with you, because I wanted some money. You know, I had a world that was waiting on me. <laughs> Every day of my life is I could give that to my father. Do one of the greatest things you'll have in heaven. And he will stand before him. And he will say, Lord, I did this just for you, for your honor and glory. Why should we labor 11th hour? Well, the plea of the Savior. This man goes out several times. How about you? How about you? And somewhere in this room tonight, I believe with all of my heart, there's a young person sitting, sitting here that you've been struggling with in your heart about the call of the ministry. It should not be a good night for you to say, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? There's a cross for everyone. There's a cross for you. That's a song they sang that night, Jack. About 8.30 on a Thursday night, May the 5th, 1965, when I said, yes, Lord. Amen. Yes, Lord. There's a young lady in here. You're thinking about your life. You're thinking about maybe this field of service or that field of service, but there's a place God wants you to serve from. You just say, yes, tonight, Lord, I'll do it. And I'm gonna tell you, the happiest place you'll ever be in your life is in the will of God. I promise you that. I had all kinds of dreams when I was growing up. What I wanted to be, I wanted to be this, and I wanted to be that. And, and, I, and listen, I never thought I'd be a preacher. And I want to tell you, my Sunday school teachers never thought I'd be a preacher either. <laughs> I guarantee you that. I used to throw the, my, the, we used to teach from quarter leaves there until 1950, and I'd throw the quarter leaves out the window, and I'd go get them. I'd go get the quarter, you know, so I'd tell them I had to go get the quarter, I'd drop it out of the window, I wouldn't come back to Sunday school. I would go up on the hill and ride horses during Sunday school. That worked good until my daddy found out what I was doing. And I didn't ride nothing for about two months. <laughs> that was the old days. That was when parents ruled the house. So, long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Come on. You know what I mean, don't you? You still listen to me? Still love me? Yes. Okay, good. If you listen real good now, me and Brother Sexton going to sing a special the second Thursday of next week. <clears throat> By the way, didn't he do great on that song? Amen. See, that's good. The plea of the Savior. Here's the last thing. With five points under it. Why labor the 11th hour? Because the harvest is precious. How many of you ever put a garden out? Ever put a garden out? You folks over here in this city, you have a garden out? There's a lot of work in a garden, you know that? I remember when I, I was going to go down and years ago, I just thought of this, darling, again, I was trying to date Gail here and I went down to get her to go, we we're going to go somewhere and her daddy said she can't go till she gets all the potatoes out of the field. <laughs> what kind of man is this to make his daughter work in a tater patch? Come on, somebody help me. Made a good wife, yeah, that's right. So buddy, I said, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna save time. I'm gonna go out and dig them taters before she gets here. That was a bad mistake. <laughs> Have you ever known that tater digging sure is hard? Uh, potatoes, I'm sorry, is hard. Well, I wait for her dad to get home thinking he's gonna be proud of me. And he says, that sure was dumb. He got a plow out and plowed them all out in three seconds when I took me a half a day to try to get out. He said, he said to her, she said, you want to go up with somebody that dumb? <laughs> she did. <laughs> I think she was like me. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm in too much trouble. Let me get out of this point. But you invest your money in it, invest your time, your energy, sowing the fields, fertilizing, weeding it, watching it, protecting it. You pray about the weather because the harvest is precious. And so are the souls of men. 
heard a preacher say this some time ago. And let, me, let me briefly get to this. And we're we're going we're gonna to head toward the, the altar. He said, there's five ways you can determine how, how valuable something is. Five ways. First of all is who created it makes it valuable. Who made it? John Deere tractor? Let me ask you a question. You're valuable, aren't you? Who created you? Does that make you valuable? Come on, sure you are. You didn't come from some monkey somewhere. You may act like it, but you didn't. They checked my family tree and there was nobody hanging from their tails, a few of them hanging from their necks. Come on, let's get with it. How can you determine something valuable or not? Because of the possibility of what it can become. You look at a marble stone sometime, we don't see anything, but the sculptors can see that. Think of the man, what he saw when he looked at Mount Rushmore. What it could become. What are we going to become? One day we'll be like him, for we should see him as he is. Next thing is durable because of how long will it last. We're made for eternity. Fourth thing is how rare it is. A stamp, a coin, autograph of Christopher Columbus. How rare you are. You're rare. When God made you, he made nobody else like you. You're rare. But in reality, the value of something is determined by what someone would give for it. I've got all kinds of baseball cards I kept through the years. I've got them in a building store down there. I hadn't seen them for 10 years probably. I pulled out a little book here several years ago and it said this card here that I had, I forget who it was, said it's worth $34, one card. You know what my problem was? I couldn't find anybody to give me $34 for it. Right? But you want to know how valuable you are? The Bible says in Acts 20, 28 that Christ purchased the church with his own blood unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's how valuable you are. Brother Sexton will remember this when he came over and preached for us on Sunday night. He was so gracious to come back on Tuesday night and we had a little family there called the Morrison Sisters <laughs> and they sang for us. And one of their songs, here's what they said, and I, I say it too many times, I said it, I'm sure it, at, at the college, but it's good about Jesus Christ. What, listen to this just for a second. He gave his back to the whips of man, his cheek to the smiters, his body to be broken. He gave his soul for sin. He did that. He barred a womb to be born in, he barred a stable. For a while, he barred clothes and he barred a donkey and he barred a tomb. You and I are the only thing he ever bought. Amen. Oh, what a savior! Amen. I want you. I know we talk about the authority of scriptures. This is a challenge to you, this 11th hour. Let's be faithful to the word of God. Amen. Let's just, let's preach the word. This in season, out of season. This is our authority. This is God's book. This is God's message to us. Let's be faithful to it. I close with one illustration. I love this illustration. I probably have told it too many times. Maybe I've told it here several times. I don't even have any idea. I love it though. <clears throat> At my church, we got all my stores, we got them numbered. I started on one, they said, that's number 12. <laughs> my jokes are numbered, and I just point and they laugh at them. I say a number. <laughs> number two. <laughs> I'm crazy, aren't I? But boy, I'm enjoying being crazy. Had this guy at our church came, he thought he was going to tell jokes, you know. He said number two, nobody laughed. I said number two, everybody laughed. He said, what's wrong? I said, well, some people can tell jokes and some people can't. <laughs> That's awful, isn't it? I gotta get to this story so we can get out of here. Have any of you ever seen, 
I want you to confess to too many sins here before we give invitation, but I'll go ahead and ask you, have you ever seen uh, the movie, <laughs> oh, it's bad, The Ten Commandments? Or if I asked you, have you ever heard it? Let's just do that. Let me do it this way since you're a good Baptist here and we don't want to get you all in trouble. Have you ever read the book or heard about the story? Ever heard about, about the Ten Commandments? Yeah, two of you have. The rest of you are feeling guilty right now. <laughs> next, my next thought is going to preach against television, but we, since we've already got you there, we can't do that. In the movie, The Ten Commandments, uh, Charlton Heston, he's the leading character. And there is a literally a a uh, chariot race in there that takes about 10, 12 minutes, seriously. And uh, in the film, in the book, it didn't take it long. That's what somebody told me. <laughs> ben Hur. The director of the movie came to, to Charlton Heston and said, I want you in that chariot race. I don't want a second. I want a stunt man. I want you. And Charlton Heston said, I've never been in a chariot race in my life. And the director said, you've got three weeks to learn. Three weeks pass. Charlton Heston comes back. And he says to the director of the film, he said, I believe I can stay in the chariot. I'm just not sure I can win the race. And the director said, you stay in the chariot. I'll see to it. You win the race. And that's what God says to you tonight. It's the 11th hour. You stay in the chariot. He'll see to it you win the race. You're kind to listen. Thank you so kindly. God bless you.